on that. And finally, I want to introduce our first speaker of the morning, Dr. Mark Brunson. Uh, Mark is from is the department head in the Environment and Society Department in the College of Natural Resources. Please welcome Mark Brunson. Thanks, Darren. And uh, is, oh, you know what? If I push this button, that green light. Okay, does that help? Green light. Green light. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I'll probably screw this up, but who knows. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you very much, and um, thanks, Darren, and thanks to all the speakers from yesterday for making this scarier to come up here and follow them. Um, <clears throat> I'm also one of the people who, uh, about two weeks ago today, uh, got asked if I would consider giving a talk, and so I said, all right, well, what am I going to speak about? in this context of forest resilience, especially given that primarily, although I have a forestry background, I primarily work in rangelands right now. Um, and so what really jumped out at me was something that I've been observing over the last couple of years. For so 20 some years ago when I was at Oregon State as a doctoral student and then a postdoc, I was working um, on trying to integrate social and natural sciences into better understanding of what was going on in forests at the time. And, and people would sort of look at me like, what? Why? Huh? And then gradually <clears throat> it started getting better and better. And now, the last couple years, I've been in a situation where people say, oh, social ecological, that's what we need. What do the social ecologists say? We need a social scientist. And I'm starting to get panicky here. Uh-oh, what? If we fail, I've been knocking on this door for a quarter of a century, and we need to do this right. We need to be helpful. And so I wanted to speak a little bit about um, what we can do. Now, as I said, I've been working on this a quarter of a century, and so that means that I'm old enough to do what um, somebody called an old guy talk. So what this was, a few years ago I was asked if I would be the Keynote speak, one of the keynote speakers at the Society for Range Management's International Meeting. There was a couple thousand people there, and I was like, you know, this is really daunting, but really exciting, feeling good about myself. And then one of my friends came up, much a retired fellow, and he said, oh, I hear you're giving an old guy talk. And I said, what's an old guy talk? Well, it's when you spend a lot of time talking, ret looking ret back, for, back on your career, and then somehow use that to say something about what's happening in the forward. And, so you get to a point where you've been around long enough that they let you do an old guy talk. And there's some problems with this. And anybody who remembers this moment <laughs> from the Republican convention of 2012, sometimes when you ask the old guy to talk, you, you shouldn't have. Um, so, but basically what I wanted to talk about was that after years of skepticism or lip service, you know, now we're at a point where people are really saying, we need to think about ecosystems, forest ecosystems, any wildland ecosystem, as social ecological systems. And so one of the questions that I have is, is social science or social ecological system science ready to be able to help with this? Because I would argue that we haven't necessarily been as helpful in the past as we should have been. And then I'm going to say, because I do want to have a positive at the end, I'm going to offer a possible way that we can be more helpful and use some of my research as an example. So basically we're here because there seems to be a crisis. Um, and so we're worrying about fires, we're worrying about climate change, we're worrying about mountain pine beetles. And I, I, I did want to remind you, since I'm you know, taking on the old guy uh, role right now, that uh, this isn't the first time we've been doing this. Uh, this headline, uh, whoops, that's not the one. This, is, this headline is from the 1910, from the Daily Missoulian. This was in the middle of the big burn. Um, so concerns about forest change and disturbance aren't new. They've been sparking policy. They've been sparking research. And neither have concerns about forest managers deal with change. Some of us remember the days when, uh, you know, when, when the bumper stickers said, save a log or eat an owl. Um, I don't think they say that anymore. But <coughs> this has been going on a while. And as a result of this era, the Forest Service, some of you will remember the Forest Service decided they were going to implement something they called ecosystem management. And so some of you, anybody remember this 
Venn diagram that used to appear all the time in talks by people like Hal Salwasser or probably Jerry Franklin. Uh, no, he says no. <laughs> that somehow we needed to come up with a new forestry. That's actually what it was called when I first started looking at it. A new forestry that was going to be ecologically sustainable, economically feasible, socially acceptable. And then our management was going to magically be in this middle. And uh, I had a postdoc that I started in 1991, and my job was actually to figure out what the heck is this? You know, what is social acceptability? What does it mean? How do we measure it? And so I spent a year doing this, and I wrote some really long report that three people have read. And um, I don't know whether I actually came up with a useful answer. But what I do know is that gradually we sort of got to a point where we recognized, you know, maybe this isn't happening. I think this is probably a more reasonable expectation. What we ended up with was that we were paying, we were much more cognizant of these things. We were aware of the proximity of the circles. We were not solely thinking about this spot here in the intersection between ecology and economics, or more often just sort of looking at what would be the most economically optimal way to manage forests. So we made some progress, but probably not where we need to get. Well, now let's fast forward 20 years, and we have people like this. This comes from Scott Collins and a, and a large group of big name ecologists publishing in Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment a couple years ago, making this claim, okay, every ecosystem is influenced by human actions. The consensus view holds that for many of today's most pressing issues, the environment is best understood and studied as a social ecological system. Whenever I read this, I think about a conference in this room 20 years ago where Dave Roberts, now at Montana State University, said, humans part of the ecosystem. Humans are only part of the ecosystem if they die there and the nutrients are cycled into the forest. <laughs> you know? And Dave has admitted later he was just trying to be provocative, but nonetheless, you know, we have made a change. And this was implicit in ecosystem management. This idea that we needed to think about the intersection assumed that the social, ecological, socioeconomic um, systems were all part of it. But if those ideas really didn't get us to a place where we're happy with where we are, my question is, will a social ecological systems approach do a better job? And if not, why not? So here's one of the reasons why not. Because natural scientists don't necessarily believe all the time that social science is their equal, that we're up to the task, that we have the right tools, that we have the right ideas, that we're not too fuzzy to really be of any value. Um, and, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is like one of the you know, top, you know, in real science, top guys out there, you know, and, and uh, this tweet, and I'm not entirely sure he wrote it because there's a typo in there. Um, but I found this uh, meme all over the internet. And it sort of, even if, if Tyson didn't say it, it sort of demonstrates some ideas that people seem to have about social science. Um, and then the social scientists get all defensive and then they stand around saying, oh no, you just don't understand, you don't trust this, and then they don't actually help because they, don't, they feel like they need to defend their, their, their turf rather than try and learn how to work better with, with natural scientists. Another reason why this happens is because of the way we organize academic organizations and management organizations. So we have these silos. We say, okay, once you get the general education done, then you con concentrate in your junior year and your senior year and then on to graduate school on whatever it is that you really need to know about. And we don't really make efforts all the way through education to be able to to bring together the social and the natural scientists. And this even plays itself out in the way the agencies organize. This doesn't, you can't really see this. This is the, uh, the El Yunque National Forest in Puerto Rico. And so we have the forest supervisor, and then you know, this is their organizational chart, forest supervisor, secretary. And then we have five groups, five different branches. Law enforcement, communications, ecosystem management and planning, property management, and way over here, visitor services and enjoyment management, you know, and just, you know, the fact that, you know, they don't even put the, the boxes next to each other. I wonder how much time this, this team works with this team, 
Um, it's very often not the case. You know, they, or when they come together is on an interdisciplinary team where they're supposed to defend their particular resource. And then the third thing, and the most important, is that we really don't have the ways, or we haven't had the ways to link ecological and social systems quantitatively. Um, you know, I really liked something that Jerry Franklin said yesterday describing the, um, the, the new way of marking trees, a civil cultural approach that allows to think looking at clumps and openings and thinking about the spatial patterning because, and uses statistical uh, approaches to be able to tell us how you, know, how you should actually mark these rather than just doing it seat of the pants because a lot of times what we've been doing with social ecological stuff is seat of the pants as well. We need quantitative ways to merge these things. Here's a great example. This again is a little small, but this model comes from the Mark Twain National Forest Plan um, in Missouri. So we've got, here's how they design things. They've got this model here, we've got various alternatives. Over here we have biophysical considerations. We have maps, climate maps, road maps, river maps. We've got, then we input land, fire, stand, species information. We throw in some succession disturbance things. We create some prescriptions. Then we do some other things. Finally, at the very end, we have habitat suitability model, a decision support system, and then finally a social component. Preference for alternatives. What's that mean? It's a constraint. We've done everything. Now we have to see, now we have to see whether we can get past this last hurdle. If the social, if the human community is the hurdle rather than part of the system, we're in trouble. So, are we making progress beyond this? I think we are. Um, one of the reasons we are is because statistics continues to get more useful. And we have statisticians who are trying to think about how can we deal with fuzz? How can we deal with things that we can't measure precisely? How can we deal with, you know, with totally incompatible units? You know, how many board feet is a, is a recreation experience? You know? We have to figure out how to put those things together, and we're starting to get to a place where we can. Um, another thing is I really believe that this kind of focus on resilience and thinking about systems in a more dynamic way is a really valuable and important way to do this. And it's also important because it's a concept that's been applied to both social and ecological systems um, for a long time. And then I also, I'm going to suggest that a third way is to begin to make better use of, of systems models that are collaboratively designed with stakeholders as part of the process. Again, this goes to some of the bottom-up things that we heard about yesterday and we'll hear about later today when S Steve Daniel speaks, among others, that this is going to be part of how we can begin to think about how to use these other tools. So what am I talking about a little more? Well, a couple of statistical things. When we hear, I, all the grad students come in here in ecology and they're like, I want to do Bayesian. And they may not know what it means, and their professors will say, oh yeah, sure, or, or you know, they don't know what it means either. <laughs> Basically, what Bayesian statistics are doing is they allow you to use um, historic data, what we've demonstrably has happened in the past, to make some predictions that you can then begin to create quantitatively describe things that we cannot predict with any real certainty. Um, and you can use those, you know, so you can bring in social concepts in there. And then the other thing that you start seeing a lot more of are these structural equation models. A few years ago, Jim Grace gave the, one of his talks uh, here, I think it was 2009, a statistician with USGS down in Louisiana. And he's been really a pioneer in using stru structural equation models in ecological research. Well, where did he borrow his stuff from? Well, it turns out from social science. And so the social psychologists who've been using SEM techniques for a while, now we're starting to think about how we can put them together. And I'll give you an example of this. This is one of Jim's models, and it comes from, um, from an ecological monograph paper, which is sort of the, you know, Grace, the, the paper that really is the, the center of, of his SEM technique explanation. And it's a, it's a wetland, a su southern wetland example. And I, it doesn't really matter what, what the thing is about, but you notice we've got different kinds of processes and, and factors that are going to influence these, these parts of the system. And then he begins to develop some, <coughs> some connections between components of the system. Well, we can add to this. 
we can start to say, well, what would affect salinity and flooding? Well, the flow regime is going to affect salinity and flooding. What affects the flow regime? Well, agricultural water demand is probably one of the major factors. And that, in turn, is affected by social processes. So now we're beginning to come up with a useful model, which has got quantitatively measurable things going on in here that includes social and, and, and economic compar comparisons to it. So we, we're getting somewhere with this. All right, second thing that I think is important is resilience thinking. Um, the ecological definition of resilience, I can't remember if we've seen that yet today. I've been to so many resilience talks over the last um, two or three years. But this idea about capacity of the system to experience shocks while retaining essentially the same function, structure, feedbacks, and therefore identity. Not necessarily all the components. It looks like a lot of the definitions of restoration that we heard yesterday. Um, and a lot of people, however, have seen humans fitting into that as the shock. Humans are the disturbance agent. Humans are, are what we're being resilient against. Now we're beginning to say, wait a second. If we talk about social and ecological systems being linked, then resilience needs, we need to think about both of them. And in fact, the social ecological definition is almost identical. You know, the capacity of linked, so linked systems to absorb recurrent disturbances. Um, so let's think about the definition for a minute before. We've got recurrent disturbances. And we've got structures, processes, and feedbacks. Well, what does that mean in a social ecological system? Well, the disturbances can be either ecological or social. You can have the kinds of processes we've been talking about the last day or so. Or you can have things like ATVs, conversion to subdivisions. It can be a policy change. All of these things are disturbance events that can make a difference. And, they have, and there are structures that need to be maintained. There are going to be ecological structures we need streams, dominant vegetation types, um, you know, forest stand structures that are representative of, of a particular type of system. And then there's going to be social structures that are, that are necessary to the maintenance of the social components of the ecological system. It might be the road network, the streams, the arrangements among the different collaborators. All these are things that need to be maintained in some fashion in order to be able to maintain a functioning social ecological system. And there are processes and feedbacks, and that's where I think these conceptual models become important. As we begin to think about how do we understand our system and use it to do something, um, you know, to be able to figure out how to maintain or enhance the resilience of that system. I don't know how many people have been familiar with the work of the Resilience Alliance. It's uh, primarily Europeans, but there's Americans, Australians heavily involved in this. There's a couple of books that are really valuable because they're written in English. And they're relatively short. Um, one called Resilience Thinking, and then a new one called Resilience Practice, both by Brian Walker, former head of, of CSIRO, the Australian uh, National Research Organization, and, and a science writer, David Salt. Um, and basically, one of the things that they have been doing um, is in the practice thing, they begin to say, how can you implement the ideas of resilience? The, how can we account for the various principles, practice of uh, the components of resilience that they have built into their, into their descriptions of resilience? And they basically use state and transition models. And those are models that I don't think we use very much, see very much in forestry. In range, they're very, very, very common. And they're basically descriptions of how um, a particular site or landscape will respond to, um, to change in that system and, and decides, describes different successional non-equilibrium in a non-equilibrium sense of different successional pathways. Okay, but the, they require thresholds. They require us to think about whether you've crossed those. It's often very hard to find those thresholds. It's often very hard to detect them. We may not know when we've crossed them until we've been past them for a while. So I'm going to suggest that we can also look, when we begin to be concerned, to look for leverage points that can direct sites toward re desired outcomes, see whether or not they're, you know, hopefully before you get to a threshold. And so this is where, for example, in, as we go back to this um, bastardization of Jim Grace's model that I made, um, we had up here some social components. Where can we affect this flow regime? Well. It may be difficult for us as managers to affect locally dominant field crops or the prices of crops, 
But we can work on farmer's adoption. That becomes a leverage point. That's where we can maybe change the flow. All right. So now I'm going to use the way I have been thinking about how to, how to do this. This is my particular model of this. Um, and basically, I start with the idea that this is what we do as managers. We, we have some desired use or condition that we want to achieve. And so in order to do that, we manipulate ecosystem pattern and process in a way that history and science has told us is likely to move us toward this condition. And or we, we have an idea of what those are, and then we make a stewardship choice that we think will alter this pattern and process to reach the desired use or condition. But these don't occur. We are not managing in a vacuum. We are managing in a bigger set of things that affect what happens inside that, that oval. Um, there are large scale influences that come in there. The things like, you know, there's only so much we can do based on the climate or based on policy, based on, on economic conditions. And then there are local things that influence, the local ecological conditions, and also the local people, the manager's knowledge, the local citizenry, and how they feel about what we're doing. All of these things are, of course, totally interconnected in some fashion. They may not all the arrows may be there in all cases, but for the most part, there's a lot of connections there. Um, what the upper thing does is it really describes the bounds of the possible. The lower tells us what that affects what can happen within those bounds. It affects the variability of, you know, of the system. So in, in a, on a human side, that means policy is generally dividing the possible. And learning and adaptation, what the managers can do is defining how we can work between those things. So I threw this together. There's a lot of stuff here. The best way to describe this is to, is to give you a case study. And the case study I'm going to use is the one that I've been working on more than anything else. The, the topic that I've been working on more than anything else for the last decade, which is how do we restore sagebrush steppe ecosystems in some sort of functional or resilient attack way after wildfires and after, you know, which is tied in with invasion under a changing climate. So we've got all these different things going on at once, and we're going to try and figure out how to deal with that. Um, working in the Great Basin, and I'm going to use the, um, the floristic definition of the Great Basin where you have the same, you know, the basic plant types and not the, not the geologic definition or hydrologic definition. We know that range wildfires are increasing in size and in frequency and, in, and intensity over the past couple of decades. Um, and so we're already concerned about that. The more fires, more need for restoration. Or, and then we've got uh, regional climate models are telling us that it's going to be warmer in the summer. And as Simon Wong told us yesterday, we don't know whether it's going to be wetter or not. But even if it is wetter, it may not help. Um, and in the winter, we're going to have more rain and less snow. So the water may come more often, but it may be in times when it's less useful. And so when we put this all together, it seems like we really need climate adaptive post-fire restoration strategies and not simply the you know, restoration strategies, uh, fire restoration strategies. We've got different things going on to affect that. We've got cheatgrass invasion which is in changing the frequency of fires. They're coming more frequently. In the meantime, we've had fire suppression that has allowed a lot of encroachment by, by dang, dang trees. Um, although I guess if you're from the Northwest, juniper aren't trees. Um, but anyway, and then you get really large trees as they come across the canopy of these things that used to be more common in savannas at this particular elevation than they are now. So if we put this back into my model, we've got in this case, we've got a, a cheatgrass landscape, which is something we, you know, that's our current pattern. We're not happy about it. Our desired use or condition is to maybe have better wildlife habitat, more forage for livestock, um, have a functioning ecosystem. So we implement some sort of treatments. It might be burning some of the juniper in a prescribed way. It might be herbiciding um, after a burn to be able to prevent uh, cheatgrass from coming back if we're spraying something like plateau, which they just yesterday started spraying out on the hillsides right outside our, my, my home south of here. Um, and the idea is that we're going to somehow return to a more idyllic state, a real rangeland of some sort. Um, so given, <coughs> excuse me, um, given this, this is sort of the, the management stand of space we're working in. But 
we've also got all those contextual things going on, right? So the question became that I wanted to explore was what, how does our choices possibly be influenced by those contextual factors, these, these outside factors? And the, the choice that my grad student, Hillary Whitcomb, and I focused on is we got interested in Forbes. And this comes largely because as a range person, well, let me back up. When I, was a, when I was started my doctorate in Forest Street, Oregon State University, I wanted to study understory res plant response to, uh, to, to different kinds of silvicultural um, prescriptions. And these were the ones that were supposedly ecologically based. We're starting to look for, you know, snag retention treatments and, and patch cuts of various sorts, different kinds of things than we had been doing in the Douglas fir region. And I thought I wanted to study understory re plant response, and people basically said, why? If, if we have understory plants, we just spray them. You know, the whole point is to get us Douglas fir trees. And, the, you know, and I was in the management side. I wasn't on the science side of that particular, of, of, of the College of Forestry. And so I ended up not doing that. I, I got to, uh, started doing the social um, side of things instead, but I've always had this strong interest in the understory and this frustration that it seems like dominant species are all that land managers are trained to deal with. And I get into range and lo and behold, it's the same thing. They care about grasses, you know, because cows eat grasses, because there's grasses are visible, you know, they're <coughs> they tend to dominate the, the understory. Or they care about shrubs because Mule deer eat shrubs, and because, uh, because shrubs affect our ability to be able to get the forage. But it turns out that forbs, while they're a relatively small part of the biomass, and they're often ephemeral and harder to identify and harder to keep track of, but in terms of species, in terms of diversity, in most systems, <coughs> there's more forbs than anything else. So sh if we're really interested in maintaining the system, shouldn't we be thinking about how to maintain the Forb community? So our question became, all right, you know, they're important for, the only time when people really pay attention to Forbs is if they think they've got sage grouse problems. And then they go, oh, we need Forbs. You know, and it may be that their problem is actually winter habitat, but it's like, we need sage grouse Forbs because that's when we think about it. And I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious. These are people who I work with and really respect. So don't, don't, I mean, I don't want people to feel like I'm, I'm uh, disparaging them. I'm just saying, you know, that we tend to fall into these habits. Um, and so my experience has been that Forbes really haven't been a very high, low, high priority in post-fire restoration or rehabilitation. It's important that I make this distinction. We often use the term restoration when what we kind of mean is rehabilitation in a range sense. So we get a fire. We know we need to get something out there. The program that we use, you know, that is actually called emergency stabilization and rehabilitation. There's nothing about restoration in there. But we talk about restoration because we know that that's when the opportunity is there. That's when there's actually money to do something. That's when we can go in and we don't have to do NEPA in order to be able to get some seeding done. Because if there's a fire, we can get a categorical exclusion. Otherwise, if we want to do preemptive restoration or do something else, then we have to go through a NEPA process and it's more work. So, you know, so we tend to conflate these terms. All right. So what did we do? Well, we did both ecological and social research. One of the things we did is we took these little, these are open top chambers. They're basically fiberglass warming devices that elevated the temperature about two to three degrees C um, over the course of the growing season. And then we randomly planted different species of four um, inside or outside of, of these um, these devices at the Green Canyon uh, field station. But then we also did a study of range managers to see how they perceived climate change, what did they think was going to come out of this study, how did they perceive the importance of Forbes and the importance of restoration. Because no matter what we find out here, if it's not going to be implemented here, it doesn't really matter. So what did we find? In the field experiment, well, we found that the warming effects tend to be different for each species. That shouldn't surprise anybody. Roughly in this way, so this one we, could, we couldn't even figure out how to grow this one, even though it's in a lot of seed mixes, so other people could figure it out. 
But gradually, you know, the species that did the best under the warming treatment um, were this blue flax. And then this guy right here, which is a non-native, Rhodium cicuparium, um, red stem fillery. And so one of my concerns is, OK, does it mean that after climate change, will some of the non-natives actually do better if we have warmer summers than some of the natives? So that was one of our questions. We, but also, these guys are pretty common in restoration seed mixes. Um, bottom line, if climate change is going to negatively affect them and they're in the seed mixes, might that mean that we're not having the right seed mixes and we need new ones? So how are we going to get there? Well, we asked the managers. Okay, so about half of the interviews were interviewees were not convinced the climate was changing. Um, and at first, is, you know, a lot of people are like, <gasps> aren't they trained in universities? What's wrong with these people? Well, they come from a demographic that where doubt in climate change is pretty common. And it shouldn't really surprise us that they don't just suddenly come to the university and drop everything else they ever knew. <coughs> um, and the managers who were concerned were saying, well, I'm not going to do anything about it until the BLM tells me how. Um, only about half said that they really pay that much attention to Forbes species selection. And they often just choose the cheapest ones. Um, or, you know, the Forbes, it's like when we have some money left over, here's what we can get. And what can we get? Well, the, the starred ones, the expensive ones, are the natives. The others, you know, the, the, the grass and the Forbes species that are cheaper are not natives. So the tendency is to go for the ones that you can afford. All right, so now let's put this back in the model. I'm about to wrap up here. And what happens? Well, <clears throat> so what do we found here? Okay, we've got a wildfire which is affecting local conditions, which is in turn affecting our decision processes in here. Um, so we identify that, you know, that this connection here, the local people say, oh, we've got a fire. We need to do something. And so we're going to do what we always do because, you know, at least that's one way to think about it. But because budgets are tight, we're going to choose the species that we can get. And because supplies are often tight in a big fire year, we're going to choose whatever we can get. And we're not really going to pay that much attention to whatever is going on in Washington, D.C. about climate change because we're not sure we really even believe it anyway. And, um, and if we screw up, the reward system hurts us if we try something new. So, you know, nobody's really doing anything. Meanwhile, neither is c Congress. Whoops. And so we end up in a situation where the seed mixes aren't working. We eventually, some Forbes disappear. And we need to find leverage points. Well, where might they be? Well, I can think of two. One would be to put more money towards seed, you know, seed uh, developing plant materials. How many people have watched the last two months in Washington and think we're going to get more money for something as esoteric as seed development? The other place is figuring out how we find new treatments. So this tells me this is where we need to think about it. We need to be working at the lower scale. We need to be thinking about how we enhance resilience of these systems by looking, are there other treatments that can help us get the plants that are, we can get established and maintained so that we do have a functional Forb community, even if it's not necessarily the same suite of species. And uh, you know, I'm a big fan now of, of Lewis Flax because that's the one that did really well under the warmer conditions. In fact, four years later, it's the only one that we planted in 2009 that's still on the site. OK, so I'm finishing here. I, my point, if there was one, um, is that resilience can be in enhanced if we, if we think about sociological systems. We account for the links between the systems. We describe both the natural and anthropogenic processes that are going to affect the systems. If we anticipate how they may be affected by shocks, we can start to use models to do this. These process models begin to give us, I would argue, they begin to give us the kinds of things to be able to apply the statistical techniques. Because now we can say, what do we need to measure? What do we need to enumerate? And we have now some of the statistical techniques that will allow us to do this. So I think we are ready to make a contribution. And I hope that you will have an opportunity to participate when we do. So thank you.
And there were lots of diagrams and arrows, and it's early in the morning, but I'm guessing someone has. Yes, sir. Yeah, I know you got going fast there at the end, but I was a little uh, concerned with the message that the social and economic implications lead us down to favoring one plan. Oh, no. In fact, we can't for a couple reasons. I mean, first of all, we can't because we shouldn't. Second, um, we can't because we can't grow enough of one plant to be able to um, use it. And third, when I asked, I asked Wayne Paget, who um, runs the Colorado, plant Na Colorado Plateau Native Plant Increase Project for the BLM, I said, you know, you, this is kind of interesting, you know. And he said, you know what? I really worry about flax because it's too easy to get the European blue flax seed sold as Lewis flax. So, I mean, those are three different reasons. But basically, you're absolutely right, Paul. We do not need to go to one species. But what we can do is, I mean, I just tested four different kinds of plants, right? There's lots of things that we can figure out how to do. And we can, fi you know, we can figure out how to grow more of those because we know they're climate adapted. We could figure out how to main has established them better. Um, my student has worked on to sort of thinking about more about soil status and how that's so how um, the how we affect soil surface after a fire and how that influences post fire regeneration. So there's um, there's a lots of things that can go into that last piece. And I'm sorry if I made it seem like flex is the answer. Um, yeah. Have you uh, assessed the response uh, in recovery after fire uh, based on different grazing practices? You know, um, I'm part of a large work group called the, the Sagebrush Step Treatment Evaluation Project. And we, um, <coughs> we had to reject grazing as an experimental treatment because, one, we couldn't treat a large enough area for to really s simulate what grazing does. And second, we couldn't be sure that the treatment would be applied equally across all of our different sites from central Washington to southwestern Utah. But I continue to be concerned about this because you know, we're s we really do need to know more about that. Um, but I have not um, really looked at this. There are people looking at it. We, um, we the Great Basin Fire Science Delivery Project has been working on getting a synthesis based on how, um, when and how we should graze post-fire, because I think we do need to know more about this. There was another hand. Yeah, Greg. Yeah, I, I think you're uh, absolutely right in identifying <coughs> incentives as an important linkage between the high-level policy <coughs> side of the diagram and the, and the lower right-hand side. Um, you didn't really address how incentives affect the behavior that you're trying to change between the system and the, and the people involved. Mm -hmm. but, um, I think there's also, a, I guess the solution, I guess, is that I think there's a lot of policy that fits in between congressional action mm -hmm. and individual <coughs> action. Yeah. There is a great deal of opportunity to affect. Yeah, you know, the, the one of the projects that I'm involved in is the the SEEP, the um, Conservation Effects Assessment Program that, that Natural Resources Conservation Service has been doing the last five years. And one of the things we're looking at there is how do, you know, which practices that they have incentives for are working, are, you know, do we have the best evidence that they're working? But also at what incentives seem to be best at implementing those kinds of, because that's the kind of, that kind of, pro, pro, that kind of, policy implementation occurs at that intermediate space where you actually can work. Because as, um, as Jerry said earlier, you know, I mean, Representative, or sorry, Senator Wyden, this tells me how long I've been gone from Oregon. Um, <laughs> Senator Wyden is saying, um, you know, I can only deal with two or three types of forests, you know, or types of old growth. That's the way that congressional, that's also about the, the you know, the, the within system variability. But you're right, there probably should be an intermediate level to my model, Greg. But then it would have to be 3D, and I don't have the technology. Yeah, Emily. 
So uh, I was I was interested to see. Um, it seems like the the managers maybe aren't. Uh, maybe they're so busy or whatever's going on. They're not necessarily in the same place as the scientists in terms mm -hmm. of the latest science. So I'm wondering if you guys have thought about ways to support them getting that information or, or applying that information. Oh, <coughs> the question was. The, the managers, you know, often seem too busy to get information. I'm going to put in a shameless plug here. Um, for the fire science delivery programs, and uh, we've got, yes, okay. There are, one of the things that I really think is a huge benefit of new things that's been going on, thanks, especially in the fire community, thanks to JFSP, Joint Fire Science Program, is we're putting a huge amount of effort into finding ways to get the science to the managers more frequently, more often, and in ways where they can use it more effectively, rather than the old way we did things, which is we do our experiments, then we spend a year waiting for the grad student to finish the dissertation, then we spend another year trying to get it ready for publication, then we spend another year waiting for it to appear in a publication. We can't do that anymore. Every research project I have has an outreach program. Immediately, we just can't, if we're gonna, we just have to get information out faster. And we also have to train scientists to be able to do that better. And that's a whole other talk that I don't have time to give. But thanks. <laughs>